Carnival was founded in 1972 and quickly became a pioneer of shorter, cheaper cruises. You know, Vegas style. Considering 1972 was the year of the Munich Olympics terrorist attack, Bloody Sunday, and Watergate, it makes sense that people wanted to literally leave the Earth for a weekend escape. Carnival even went so far as to call their ships the Fun Ships. And uh, that's where the sinning starts. Calling your ships the Fun Ships is already pretty uninventive. But if you're gonna follow that decision up with a mascot, couldn't you come up with something better than, I kid you not, Fun Ship Freddy. It's not even a full alliteration. He's shaped like a carnival logo, which is shaped like a whale's tail. So he's in the image of an interpretation of the shape of a whale's tail. Cruises usually divide their ships up into classes because apparently on both land and sea, we cannot avoid classism. Cruise lines are constantly trying to make bigger and better ships and the Carnival Destiny built in 1996 became the first passenger ship to exceed 100,000 tons. I genuinely don't understand how this floats. So if you want to explain that to me in the comments, please do. However, if we can still support a bastardized oceanic version of the class system, I'm sure we can find it in ourselves to fear the unknown and call it a sin just so we don't have to try to understand it. One of their ships, the Carnival Destiny, was rechristened the Carnival Sunshine in 2013, implying that we will indeed end up being roasted by the sun. Man, that was a good movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Back in 2005, Hurricane Katrina decimated the Gulf Coast with tens of thousands of people displaced. FEMA needed to find a place to put them. And Carnival cruise ships were there to help, offering to house 10,000 and refugees for six months for the low, low price of $236 million. Now, if you think that sounds reasonable, consider that seven day cruises could be had for $600 in 2005. At $600 per person for six months, FEMA could have sent the refugees on a six month cruise, including entertainment and docking for $144 million. Now, while this does reflect poorly on FEMA, it also means Carnival took advantage of Hurricane Katrina and used the government's lack of preparation to almost double what they would have made just running their regular cruise schedule. In 2013, Carnival sent out a memo to their crew members alerting them of the suspension of their retirement benefits. And while the retirement benefits were small in comparison to other retirement benefits, so was their normal compensation. Carnival justified the change, saying they were following a new maritime law and making contributions to social security programs for countries that have social security programs. However, not every country has social security and crew members are from all over the world, meaning some employees were screwed out of benefits entirely. In September of 1999, a fire broke out in the engine room of the Carnival Tropical. Passengers were told to stay at their muster stations, emergency positions on the dock by lifeboats from 6.30 p.m. To to 5.20 a.m. without being told what was going on. Think about how horrifying that would have been. Just be sitting there and be like, oh, what's, are we going to, is this Titanic part three? See, it's part three because there was already a Titanic two, the movie. Some of the passengers would have been aware of that. There was a Titanic two as in about a different Titanic? Yeah. Will it sink this time? Yes. Did it sink? Yes, it will. While only 10% of the passengers felt their lives were at risk, 95% said they were never told what to do in case of fire. I mean, yeah, sure, they were on a piece of metal surrounded by water, but still, I have to be told where the fire exits are every single time I'm in a school auditorium. You'd think they'd have some sort of outline for their passengers. Also, did the remaining 5% just have a super informative bag boy? In 2010, the engine room of the Carnival Splendor caught fire, resulting in the power shutting off and the ship being stranded 200 miles off the coast of Mexico. They spent a couple days at sea before being towed to a port in Mexico. And this is where the trouble starts. Mexico was in an all out war with the drug cartels at the time and passengers had to travel 50 miles by bus through the country before they could reach the Californian border. I don't know about you, but if I go on a cruise, I don't expect to have the opportunity to become a vice on the ground reporter on a massive drug war. What fun ships. The ironically named Carnival Triumph found itself adrift after yet another Carnival engine fire in 2013. Now the conditions on the Triumph were much worse than those on the Splendor and Tropical. There was no running water, which meant no toilets. People did their business in little red bags like they were pups. The worst part? There was no alcohol being served. Not very fun, fun ships. People started sleeping in tents on deck, hoarding food and growing grumpier by the day, which is understandable when you have literal piles of shit surrounding your living quarters. Now, you may ask, what did passengers receive as compensation? They received reimbursement on their cruise expenses, a refund for the cruise, a credit for a future cruise, $500, and the basic understanding of a post-apocalyptic landscape. Now, you might hear that and think, oh, that's pretty generous. 
Let me enlighten you. The Carnival Triumph set sail knowing they were at an increased risk of fire because of a fleet-wide generator fire hazard. That doesn't sound very fun. Not only that, but they began the trip with two of their six generators inoperational. There were multiple maintenance reports that were uncovered, going back over a year, saying generator number six was overdue for maintenance. And in an unsurprising twist of events, it was generator number six that ended up catching fire. Man, that's really weird how that thing that wasn't working well continued to not work well? I wonder if there's some kind of logic that could have led them to prevent this incident. No, probably not. The problem was noted in 2012 when one of Carnival ships caught fire in the Indian Ocean. Fuel had leaked from a line onto a hotspot and caught fire, leaving the ship stranded for three days. The resulting investigation revealed a problem with their flexible fuel lines, with nine leaks uncovered in a two-year period. And it was one of those leaks that caused the Triumph to catch fire. Some passengers who felt the $500 wasn't quite enough compensation for living in King's Landing as conditions decided to sue Carnival. And Carnival countered that by saying, the ticket contract makes absolutely no guarantee for for safe passage, a seaworthy vessel, adequate and wholesome food, and sanitary and safe living conditions. That's fucking terrifying. You should take note of that seaworthy vessel bit there because that means Carnival does not promise they will have safe ships for their cruises, which technically lets them off the hook for fuel leaks, whether they knew about them or not. Now, I don't technically promise that people who come over to my house won't be eaten because it would be strange to put that in writing, not because it might happen and I don't don't want to be legally responsible if it does. What a fun little bit of fine print, right? A month later, the Carnival Dream had an emergency generator failure while docked in St. Martin. Carnival decided to fly the passengers back to Florida instead of trying to complete the voyage, which means I guess they learned something? This end comes when you realize that ship went on its next cruise one week after the generator failure. If my car's engine was fucked up, it would take a few days to fix. Assessment, ordering parts, installing them, running checks. How long would it take for a 1,000 foot long, 130,000 ton cruise ship to get fixed up? I feel like it should be more than a week. But hey, let's just slap some duct tape on it. That's way more fun. To add insult to injury, the Carnival Dream was the ship featured in the 2011 film Alvin and the Chipmunks Chipwrecked, which I find fucking hilarious. The irony, not the movie. <laughs> Never the movie. In 2013, Michael Moses Ward died in a hot tub at 41 on the dream. Ward was the only child survivor of the 1985 move bombing, but apparently the dream just didn't give a fuck. It seems like carnival ships are no strangers to death. An electrician was killed in an elevator accident while working on the carnival ecstasy. Also, the area wasn't covered up immediately, resulting in an unfortunately accurate recreation of the Shining's elevator scene for passengers. I'm fairly certain that's not what the passengers had in mind when they heard there was dinner theater. At 8.15 a.m. on October 14th, 2017, the Carnival Glory had just docked in Miami after a seven-day cruise when an eight-year-old girl fell 20 feet from the ship's atrium to a lower deck, and she passed away en route to the hospital. The railing she fell over was only 47 inches tall, so foul play wasn't expected. But the ship left dock at 6 p.m. that day. How much of an investigation can really be done in seven hours when passengers are everywhere disembarking and boarding? And finally, when a 23-year-old man went overboard on the Carnival Victory off the coast of Cuba, a 16-hour search covered over 3,000 square miles before it was called off and the man was declared lost. We can't really send Carnival for the man falling overboard or the failed Coast Guard search. Shit happens. Although, statistically, Carnival passengers are more likely to go overboard on Carnival cruises than any other cruises. I guess that's just the risk you have to take if you want to cruise with Funship Freddy on one of his fun ships.